All right, have a question here uh, that came up in the comments. I saw it. And I thought, well, it's it's you know it's a good question. Um, who was the serpent in the garden, the Garden of Eden? Who was the serpent? Because he's not named. All right, so you know, obviously, most people would say, well, Satan. But uh, let's actually go through the scriptures and see who this was. And it is Satan, by the way. We'll just I'll just tell you right up front. But I'm going to show you the reason why it's Satan. Very interesting. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Let's read here. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. It's kind of funny, anybody that worships the devil, you're worshiping a created being that is subservient to God. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Changes God's word, in other words. And she added to God's word, God never said, Don't touch it. Verse 5, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Interesting, because those are three things that the devil still uses to this very day to deceive the vast majority of people. You say, what is it? The tree was good for food. They like good tasting things. So they put excitotoxins in, like aspartame and... and uh, uh, monosodium, mono, monosodium glutamate, MSG, and other things like that. It's called an excitotoxin. It's a chemical that makes your brain think, oh, this is really good, and you feel, I want more, and I want more. Yeah. The tree was good for food. Oh, that's such good food and things. The vast majority of people in America, and around the world too, but the vast majority of people in America especially, I mean, they got, they got food in stores here that's banned in other countries. But the vast majority of people that are eating food and things like this, it's toxic, literally um, industrial waste. It's terrible, terrible. But they put chemicals into it, um, food coloring and things like that to make it look good, excitotoxins to make the brain think it's tasting good. And you see cellulose in it and things like that. It's sawdust, essentially, you know, plant fiber, and to make you feel like you're full. And it has almost no nutritional value, and it's got all kinds of toxicity in it. And it's incredible. But see, the devil knows he can get most people to go to the fast food restaurant and pull in there and get your burger and fries and soda pop and things like that because it tastes good. And he can destroy people because of that desire of the flesh to have something that tastes good. Kind of weird, isn't it? And then it was pleasant to the eyes. Hmm. How about that one? Pleasant to the eyes. Men lust after a woman. Why? She's pleasant to the eyes. You drive past the car dealership and you look in there and you see that new vehicle and you go, ooh, look at that. That's the new 2018 whatever. Pleasant to the eyes. Why do people build big houses? Especially retired people. That's the one that makes me laugh. Two people. All the children moved out. Two people. We're going to build a retirement home and 4,000 square foot log home or something. Why? Pleasant to the eyes. What's the third thing? And a tree to be desired to make one wise. Oh, oh, you have a PhD? You have a THD, a THM as well, and a DD, and a, oh, a bachelor's and a master's and a... Uh-huh, people worship education. Oh, yeah. Not much changes. Verse 7 and the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking, walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife did hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee? that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, whereof I commanded thee, that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to me to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said 
uh, unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Okay, let me just say this real quickly here. People talk about, you know, you get atheistic fools that just look for anything that they can to get rid of the Bible because it condemns their sins. Uh, they're very wicked people. I've never met a morally good atheist. They're all wicked. Um, but, you know, that's the whole point of being an atheist is so you can say, well, there's no judgment for my sin coming, so then you can do whatever you want. They just pretend that they're good. It's funny. But uh, it's they say, it was a talking snake. Uh no, it's not a snake in the sense of the modern definition of snake. How do you know? Well, there in verse 14, um, And upon thy belly shalt thou go. So before this happened, the serpent was walking. And I'm going to show you who it was here in just a little bit and why it was walking. Okay. It was not a snake in the sense of, you know, you see these depictions of the Garden of Eden. There's this tree and this coiled snake around the thing. And he's, you know, got his head poking around at Eve and he's with his tongue and stuff. Uh-uh. Nope. Nope. Doesn't work that way. I'll show you who this is as we continue. Okay. Verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said... Okay, well, I'm actually going to stop there. We're going to verse 15. And I just want to say this. I do not believe in the serpent seed doctrine, this thing people say when it says there that he beguiled Eve, that that means that they actually had sex. And then, then just to be quite a, kind of blunt there, you know, they committed fornication. And, you know, then they, they had, you know, she gave birth to Cain, and then that was actually Satan's descendant or something like this. I don't believe that. Um, there's a whole lot of problems that come in there. Um, it's just simply, you know, because then you have, literally, you have a whole bunch of people on the earth that, that are Satan's children, and you can't, I mean, physical children, not just, you know, physical descendants, not just spiritually speaking. Um, and then it's like, it's, it's just, there's a whole lot of problems. Um, people that reject the Lord, uh, the Lord said to them in John chapter 8, he said about, you know, the Pharisees, he said, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. Um, it was because of, you know, not because they were descendants of, you know, the devil, because what was the point of the Lord trying to go out and minister to the Jews and to the Pharisees as well, if he knew that a lot of them were just the serpent seed, you know, or some kind of, it, it just gets really convoluted. Um, I've been over the whole thing. I've looked at all the different scriptures and the arguments and whatever. I don't believe in the serpent seed thing. Um, I think it's nutty. But uh, let's go to Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel 28. There's a lot of different theories out there that you hear and people come up with this stuff and it's just like, it really gets... Kind of wacky, you know, and then you come up with a question, well, what if you're a descendant of Satan and therefore, you know, I mean, uh, the Bible talks about Eve is the mother of all living too. That's kind of a problem. But, uh, you know, well, I guess you could say, well, Eve is the mother of Satan's seed and, you know, Adam's children or something like this. Okay, but what if you're a descendant of the bloodline of Satan? Can you get saved? or something? It just, that's why I'm saying just, just, I'd stay away from that. But let's see who this was in the Garden of Eden, because the Bible just calls him the serpent. So who was this? I'll give you another clue here. Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Now look at this, verse 13. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, the topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets, and of thy pipes uh, was and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Okay, stop right there. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Now, 
Genesis chapter 3, who's in the, who's in the, the uh, Garden of Eden? You have four different you know, people essentially mentioned there. You have God, you have Adam, Eve, and the serpent. So who are we talking about here? Ezekiel chapter 28, verse uh, 13 there, well, 12 down through, verse 19 there, it's talking about this serpent. Now, who is this serpent? Let's keep reading. Verse 14, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Now, some of this stuff is just like, okay, I have no idea what that is. We'll know when we get up up there. What is the stones of fire and things like that? I don't know. I have no idea. But the whole point is here, this serpent, obviously it's the serpent that was in the Garden of Eden. He's called the anointed cherub that covereth. And God set him in a position of authority. Verse 15, Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. What was the iniquity? He lied to Eve. He stepped in there when they were, I mean, Adam and Eve were walking with the Lord. They were literally taking walks with him and talking with him and things like that. And the devil gets in there and usurps the Lord's position and calls God a liar and changes the word of God. Gets Eve to change it and he changes it as well. Ye shall not surely die, he says. When God said, ye shall surely die. By the multitude of thy merchandise, thy, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings, and they, that they may behold thee. And, of course, this is like major prophetic stuff. I mean, you could do whole studies just in this passage here. But it's talking about the devil. We'll see that here um, towards the end of the study. Uh, verse 18. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. Again, Revelation chapter 20. Satan is loosed out of the bottomless pit at the end of the millennial kingdom. He goes out to deceive the nations. They come up to Jerusalem and fire comes down from heaven, out of, or from God out of heaven and devours them. You can read about that in Revelation chapter 20. Verse 19. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror and never shalt thou be any more. Okay? Right now the devil's a terror. I mean, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. All right? Thus the glorious, light of the glorious gospel should be revealed unto them, I think it says. But the point is, he is the God of this world. And the only way to get high up in the political realm is to serve Satan. Just as simple as that. You're not going to see a Christian rise up to the top of politics or pretty much to anything else. All right? Um, we're put down quite a bit. But you see there, the serpent, we can see here, this anointed cherub, the covering cherub, it says down there in verse 16, anointed cherub in verse 14, all right? He was in Eden, according to verse 13, the garden of God. So we're dealing with the serpent here, right? Ezekiel chapter 10. What is a cherub? Good question to ask. Are they angels? No, they're not. And you could say, well, it's an order of one of the angels or something like this. Well, you know, I'd have to challenge you on that. Where does the Bible actually call a cherubim an a cherub or a cherubim an angel? Cherubim is a plural of cherub. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 14. And it's talking about cherubims and cherub here throughout the chapter. Chapter 10, it's all about it. You can just see cherubims. Cherub, cherubims, cherub, you know, it's all throughout the thing. Um, verse 14, Ezekiel 10, 14. And everyone had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub, and the second face was the face of a man, and the third the face of a lion, and the fourth the face of an eagle. 
uh, and the cherubims were, were lifted up. This is a living creature that I saw by the river of Chebar. Uh, just looking over my notes here. And when the cherubims went, the wheels went by them. And when the cherubims lifted up their wings to mount up from the earth, the same wheels also turned not from beside them. When they stood, these stood. And when they were lifted up, these lifted up themselves also, for the spirit of the living creature was in them. Then the glory of the Lord departed from off the fresh threshold of the house and stood over the cherubims. And the cherubims lifted up their wings and mounted up uh, from the earth in my sight. When they went out, the wheels also were beside them. And everyone stood at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house. And the glory of the, Lord, and the, glory of the God of Israel was over them uh, above. This is the living creature that I saw under the God saw under the God of Israel by the river of Chebar, and I knew that they were the cherubims. Okay, verse, okay. Everyone had four uh, faces apiece, and everyone had everyone four wings, and the likeness of the hands of a man was under uh, their wings. And the likeness of their faces was the same faces which I saw by the river of Chebar. Their appearance, appearances and themselves, they went everyone straight forward. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a little bit, you know, getting messed up here with the different wording. I mean, this is, this is stuff that's just like, okay, I have no idea what this stuff means. And people can try to depict it and draw it and whatever else. It is some weird stuff, okay? But we see there a couple things that are very important. Number one, you have four faces on a cherubim. Verse 14, everyone had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub. The second face, the face of a man. Third, the face of a lion. The fourth, the face of an eagle. Four faces. Down there in verse 21, you had four wings. Okay? Now, there's another type of being there in heaven called seraphim. They have six wings. All right? And they're similar as far as different faces and things like that. Um, that's there. So, go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter two to the New Testament there. First Timothy chapter two, verse eleven through fifteen. We're going to see what happened there with Adam and Eve. First Timothy chapter two, verse eleven through fifteen. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Um, Adam knew what he was doing. You know, it does, you don't pick that up in Genesis chapter 3. It's just, you know, Adam, you know, she gives also, you know, to Adam and he takes it and he eats it. And you just like, oh, you know, whatever. Um, he knew what he was doing. You see, when he realized she just ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he also realized she's now got God's death sentence on her. So I'm going to die with her. Again, you know, it's a really beautiful picture of Jesus Christ dying for his bride. Um, a lot of very interesting tie-ins there. But the serpent, here's the whole point that's important. He only deceived Eve. Right? Adam was not deceived. He only came after Eve. It's an important thing to remember there. Second Corinthians chapter eleven. Go to Second Corinthians chapter eleven. Second Corinthians chapter eleven, verses one through fifteen. We'll see a little bit more about who this serpent, this anointed cherub, that covering cherub. We're going to see who it is. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent, there he is, beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. 
For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which we have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles. But though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, but we have been throughly made manifest among you in all things. Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that ye might be exalted? Because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely, I robbed other churches, taking wages of them, to do you service. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man, for that which was lacking to me the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. And in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth. But what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. Let me just stop right there for a minute. What Paul is saying is, he's saying, there are false prophets that are going to come in and beguile you, exactly as the serpent did to Eve. They're going to get you to change the word of God. They're going to get you to start doubting God's word. They're going to mess you up. They're going to start preaching another Jesus, another gospel, which we've not preached. See? That's what he's saying there. And Paul's saying, hey, you can't, you can't put the thing on me that I'm just doing this for money. All right? I preach the gospel of God to you freely. You know, and I'll say it for myself. Nobody can say that I'm doing what I do for the money. All right? I don't charge for any of my videos. I used to make DVDs just because that's before I was on YouTube and things. I used to make DVDs. I used to make money doing that. And I decided I'm not going to copyright anything I do. And I'm not going to make DVDs anymore. Uh, simply because I want to put things out for free. So, and um, it's funny because the people that complain the most about the content here and what I'm doing and my attitude and whatever else, those are the people that have never given a cent to this ministry to help keep it going. So the things that I'm lacking, I get from the brethren that do care about this ministry. And I've had some faithful brethren and they're just always there, just always count on them, help me keep my bills paid, and things like that. I appreciate them. If you've given to this ministry, I really appreciate that. But now here we go. The serpent is mentioned in verse 3. Verse 13. 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So it's talking in context here about being people being beguiled by the serpent in verse 3 over in verse 14. No marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Hmm. Satan can change shape. He can change his appearance. So we have mentioned the serpent and then you have mentioned Satan. They're one and the same. If that's not enough, I'll show you the real proof. Go back to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. If you haven't been convinced yet, I mean, I could have just gone right to this verse and boom, problem solved pretty much. But I want to go through the scriptures and just show you the different places where it talks about the serpent in the garden and, you know, the anointed cherub and, you know, all the other scriptures there. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent. Old serpent. He's been around for a while. Called the devil and... Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Yep. And I just got to read this because I enjoy it. Revelation chapter 20, verse 7. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. That's it. Ezekiel chapter 28. 
That's the fulfillment of it. Verse 10, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Bye-bye, <laughs> said the devil. So that's the answer to the question. Um, who is the serpent in the Garden of Eden? Satan. And the Bible tells everything about this being. He is very powerful. Um, he's after you. He's after me. As Christians, he doesn't like you. Uh, you can't make some kind of peace treaty with the devil. It's not going to happen. And um, he's the accuser, accuser of the brethren. Uh, Revelation chapter 12 talks about that. But it's so neat to be able to see what he's done, what he's doing, and what's going to happen to him in the future. Uh, we're not left with some kind of a vague uh, book of, of somewhat philosophical, to, you know, it's crystal clear. The devil's doom is fixed. Can't wait for that. So hopefully that answers your question. Thank you for watching.